How's it going, everybody? Uh, like Marty said, um, I'm Ben Hoffman. I'm associate director at the University of Maryland. Uh, my my background's kind of all over the place. Been a lot of different different schools, different places. Um, but I'd say as a sport background, soccer is definitely more my thing. I grew up playing. I played at Southwestern University, small D three, just north of Austin, Texas. Um, Got my, got my undergrad in kinesiology there, then went home to the University of Houston and did my master's degree, and that's where I first really got started in strength and conditioning, because at the time, Southwestern, like zero strength and conditioning to speak of, didn't have a nice weight room like they do here. Um, I think we had two racks, one being like a Smith machine type, and just like a general weight room. So I was on my own in undergrad, but fell in love with, a, with the weight room there and then really started to learn about strength and conditioning at University of Houston while I was getting a master's. Um, and the, the coaches there really showed me a lot, opened my eyes to this field and kind of where I started to fall in love with it. Um, my first job where I actually oversaw teams was at Valdosta State University. I was lucky enough to get the NSCA assistantship. So it was basically like my GA since I was already done with school but worked with women's soccer there and helped out with football. And if you know anything about Valdosta, that's pretty much what it is, is football. They call it Title Town. The two high schools that are there, the crazy football teams, and uh, was lucky enough to be part of a national championship in D2 with that football team, so that was awesome. After that, I got my first full-time job at Weber International University. It's a small NAIA school in Babson Park, Florida, which doesn't even have a gas station. So, I've, like I said, I've been all over the place, big city, small towns. Um, but I think that school, it has less than a thousand people. It's very small, but it's something like 90% athletes, so that everybody is participating. So it felt like a big place um, and learned a lot from my uh, my mentor there, Steve Russell, and who's moved on to the Blue Jays, actually. but. Just the way he ran that program uh, really helped me in my career. Um, at the time I was there, my wife, then girlfriend, was in school here in DC at GW. I decided to move up here without a job, ended up at Georgetown. I just kind of showed up on Mike Hill's doorstep and was like, hey, can I volunteer? And kind of weaseled my way in there. Um, but while I was there, I was volunteering. I was working part-time. I worked at Murray School some in the afternoons as well, which was an awesome experience. And uh, that's what led me to working at Maryland now. So I've been at Maryland for about six years, just six years earlier this month. Um, and that's kind of where I've been. And like I said, I grew up playing soccer. I didn't even know what lacrosse was until I got to undergrad probably. They had a club team and they were pretty good for a club team. They were then the first NCAA school in Texas to have lacrosse and started getting murdered by everybody. So I think that tells you kind of what lacrosse is like in Texas, but it has grown so much from when I was growing up. I kind of thinking back now, wish I could have played because it looks like a lot of fun, but it wasn't even a thing. Um, switch that to now at Maryland, probably one of, if not most storied like college lacrosse programs. Um, and having the opportunity to work with them and the great coaching staff has been a lot of fun. Um, so I'll try to do, do lacrosse some justice here, but definitely have a good soccer background. Um, kind of how I want to start, I guess, is get y'all's ideas on, first, the similarities of lacrosse. Like what are, lacrosse and soccer, what are some of the similarities between those two sports? From a sports standpoint, from a, from a physical standpoint, what do you guys think? Yeah, pretty pretty similar field size, like almost yeah, almost the same. Could be the same because soccer fields tend to go all over the place depending on the size. Both field sports, <coughs> I think, because of that, a lot of the movements you see on the field are pretty similar. So what else? Cardiovascular demands. Yeah, there's some similar cardio demands. Um, I, I'll go over it a little bit. Soccer does go a little bit longer. You spend more time on the field, but both need that aerobic base to be able to do those high intensity actions. What else? 
kind of this unique mix of short burst anaerobic speed, but also you have aerobic endurance weaved in there as well. I think, like, I mean, like, position wise, you have middies in both soccer and lacrosse, you have attackmen in both soccer and lacrosse, you have both defensive players. So, um, in terms of like how quickly the action happens or how much you need to, to move. That, that's something that stands out in my mind, just as, a, as an observer. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say tactically, obviously there's very different tactics in soccer and lacrosse, but like the goal is essentially the same. You're moving the ball over the field, trying to score a goal. You have the different positions. So a lot of those same concepts are going to be there. How about differences? What might we see? A lot more hitting. Yeah, way more contact than lacrosse, and way less diving. <laughs> what else? The implements, like the stick versus... Yeah, having a stick versus kicking, uh, or... Equipment, too. Yeah, way more equipment. I mean, and I'd say energy system, just because soccer, you can't just have substitutions like yeah. you would in lacrosse. Yeah, for sure. Anything else? Throwing sport instead of kicking, too. Yeah, or definitely a bigger upper body component in lacrosse. Uh, I would say both rotational, but just in a different way. Um, yeah, spot on, I think. Um, I, I always come back to, it seems, we talk about lacrosse and soccer, and we think, okay, these are two way different sports, but the more I think about it and the way I train them, it ends up being very similar. And I think this kind of highlights why. So I'm thinking about, and there's way more, obviously, to it than just four qualities, but what's important with these sports, I would say, is acceleration, speed, power, strength, and endurance. And now just the way that kind of lines up as an order of importance and might change a little bit. That's not to say that <coughs> for lacrosse, endurance is not important. It's still very important. But just as far as you have a lacrosse player, if they are in great shape, that's perfect. But if they can't accelerate, decelerate efficiently, change direction, then they're not going to be successful on the field. So that's just a little bit more. Um, but the way I kind of look at these two sports, these four things are, are crucial. Um, and like I said, lacrosse, acceleration, deceleration might be a little bit more important than open, like just top end speed, which might be a little bit more important than power and strength. And then endurance is that kind of last thing, the foundation for those. Whereas soccer, endurance is going to be kind of the top thing, because if you can't make it through a 45 minute half, or at least you know 30 minutes before getting subbed off. Um, it doesn't matter how fast you are, or how good you are at changing direction, you're gonna get beat. And with the sport where it might be a one-zero goal, like one-zero score to decide a game, like that's gonna make a big difference. Um, that being said, those moments where you find success on the soccer field, acceleration, deceleration, speed are very important. And then power and strength is still important to help, A, reduce injuries, but also you know, the game's getting more physical, more more speed and power based. So um, it's it's pretty important to move that way. Uh, and as I'm going today, like stop me, ask questions. Happy to not be the one rambling on. If you have a question, let me know. Um, so kind of breaking this down a little bit further, I want to look at lacrosse, the profile for this sport. Um, we a lot of you guys hit hit some of these points, um, but the game demands. So it's a half field game. This is where I see soccer and lacrosse being a little bit different. Half field game. So if we're on attack, you have a few players, defenders, goalie, just kind of chill <coughs> on the other side of the field. So they're getting more times resting. Um, there are those transitions, though. It's going to happen but you might have long spells of possession on one end of the field where some players are doing something, some players aren't. Four 15 minute quarters, so a smaller game, um, smaller segments of that game, but the subbing is open, so you get more rests in and out. Um, so there's a little bit more opportunity for that high intensity, more intermittent, I would say, than say a soccer game. Um, and that open, open subbing also is in contrast to soccer, where it's very limited with how you how you can substitute. 
um, just the implications for, for especially the endurance side of things. Um, as Marty mentioned, heavy contact um, gear. So it can be contact between bodies, contact stick slashing, contact to the head, even though that's supposed to be a flag. And during our game last week, we missed like four or five of those calls. But um, pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, pretty common for things like concussions and various contusions and broken ribs and all kinds of stuff. So definitely a rougher sport than soccer in a lot of ways. Um, typical GPS ranges. So part of my job at Maryland is monitoring GPS for both teams. Now we use different systems now. We have Catapult for men's lacrosse and VX Sport still for men's soccer. So I pulled this when we were using VX Sport for for lacrosse as well. And this is just a general range. I don't need to get, I could probably do a whole talk on just the GPS on either one of these teams. But in general, in a lacrosse game, our guys are getting 5,000 to 9,000 meters total. Um, depends on position, depends on the opponent and how much we're getting in and what the transitions are like and that kind of thing. Um, high speed distance, 300 to 700 meters, and I've seen some like way above that. John Geppard is one that tends to get closer to a thousand sometimes, um, but that's how it goes. And then high efforts, meaning high high intensity accelerations, high intensity decelerations, and high intensity sprints. Just a count of all of those things in the 80 to 150 range, and. That's just like a, think of it as an average range. We have some guys that get more than that, some that get less, but it gives you an indication of where they're at. Um, I classify this as a power speed sport because that's encompassing the speed and the power and the change of direction that's kind of important. Um, and this is where size, as in like body mass, can be beneficial, not only because of contact, um, but because producing those high forces high speeds, high change of direction, all of that being a little bit bigger can help. And you have implications for different uh, different positions, I think would be amplified. So attack versus defense, we tend to see defensive guys being a little bit bigger, being in the way, um, able to push guys around so they can keep them from getting into attacking, attacking positions. And you see attackers being a little more uh, skinny, agile, able to rotate, change direction, dodge, that kind of thing. Um, so you'll see that difference a little bit more than in, in soccer where it's a little more uniform. So that size can be beneficial and I'll also see a mix of body types. Like I said, usually mesomorphs, more your, some of your defensive guys, not to say there's not huge attack men. We, we have one right now that's a big guy and I'm trying to figure out how to get him to play like a big guy. Um, <laughs> But those mesomorphs, or the way, what I kind of look at is wide infrasternal angles, they're wider people, um, or ectomorphs, they're more narrow uh, infrasternal angles. And I use those things, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, I use those to kind of tailor programming a little bit for, for our guys. And then the culture, especially, I can't speak for all lacrosse programs since this is the main one I've worked with, but the culture for these guys is they're a bunch of meatheads. They want to be in the weight room. They want to uh, bang weights around. They have a good time in there. I almost don't have to get them going at all. It's like, here's the program, go. And I could probably go sit in the office and they're still going to be yelling at each other and getting after it. Um, it's almost needing to hold them back sometimes from themselves because they're always, always coming in, getting extra work, always want to bench press. That's just what they do. Um, which is a little bit different than, than the soccer side. So profile for soccer. Um, in contrast with lacrosse, I consider it a little bit more of a full field game, free flowing. There's not like an implicate, there is offsides. And I know everybody tends to misunderstand the offsides rule in soccer. And now with VAR, I think everybody's even more confused, but um, you can go anywhere on the field at any time, barring that offsides rule. 45 minute halves and limited subbing. So in college, it's an unlimited, unlimited number of subs, but if you get subbed out in the first half, you can't go back in in that half. And then in the second half, 
you are allowed one re-entry. So if you get subbed off, you can go back in one time. If you get subbed off the second time, then you're done. So you can't just like switch people in and out all the time. You don't have a first line, second line, like in lacrosse where guys are split, switching. Um, so that gives more of that implication for endurance being a little bit more important. Um, contact is still there. It's pretty light, and that's not to, not to say guys don't get beat up pretty good, but not quite the same. Nobody's getting hit with sticks um, or anything like that. So the body size, as far as like a protective aspect, is not as important. Um, so the data, the GPS data is where I think we see a lot of differences. And I would say the main reason is because of the duration of the game. So 90 minutes for 60 minutes and more of a continuous movement as opposed to more stoppages or at least breaks with where we are on the field. Um, our typical distances are in the 11 to 15,000 meter range. And a lot of that's walking. Don't think that they're like running the whole time. Same thing with the lacrosse. Um, guys, a lot of it's walking, but just total distance from start to finish, including warm up. Um, high speed distance is more in the 8,000 to 1,200 range, and then high efforts 175 to 250. And I don't, I think looking at this compared to the lacrosse data, you would think, oh, soccer players just do way more. And I think it's mainly because of the duration and that more continuous flow. Um, but it's something we have to account for, and they have to be able to do that two or three times a week, whereas lacrosse is usually one, maybe two times a week. So it's just a little bit different. So I'd classify soccer more as a speed and endurance sport, and those guys tend to be leaner, so that body mass isn't in, as important. They are predominantly ectomorphs, so they look a little bit more like me, skinnier, maybe hopefully taller than me, especially at the D1 level, but um, I treat most of them the same as far as programming. I don't really separate into the two groups, um, bar a couple outliers here and there. And the culture, as opposed to the meathead uh, lacrosse players, they're a little bit more about being on the field, working on fitness, getting touches. That's what they always say. It'd be more important for me to go to the field and get touches than come in and get extra work in the weight room, which is fine. Like They need to do what they need to do. The goal is to be successful on on the field, um, but that's just kind of where they're coming from. And don't get me wrong, like our team at Maryland is great. They love to work out, they come in and work hard, um, but it's not quite as much centered around the weight room as compared to lacrosse, which I think just doesn't necessarily change how I program, but it can change like how, you imp how I implement that program. So looking at off season, um, in in our off season for all college sports, it's kind of crazy. It's not probably quite the same as at the high school level or or anything else. We're restricted by hours, so we have an eight hour period where total total contact hours is only eight, four with me, four with the coaches. Then we have a twenty hour period where it's basically like a normal season where they can practice full they're doing full weight training and we'll have some games and uh, then there's like preseason periods or uh, times where they're home or it's all voluntary so we'll kind of talk about those a little bit so it gets a little muddy with with how this off season goes but I have to structure my training differently across those things just because of those hours um, so in our initial off-season training for lacrosse, this is August, September, before they start fall ball. For soccer, it'd be January, February. We're just kind of ending, or we just ended this eight-hour period for soccer now. Um, or this past week was our first full 20-hour week, but this is pre-spring ball. So for lacrosse, during this time, I'm doing speed, and this is where you'll see a lot of similarities. Like we were talking about training these sports isn't all that different, um, except for some minor nuances. But for, for lacrosse uh, during this time, speed is a little bit less of an important factor for me, more because conditioning becomes higher. I'm trying to prep them for, um, for their fall ball period. Because if you think about it, we're coming off of summer break. So this past year, we were lucky enough to win a national championship. 
I know a lot of these guys were maybe in the weight room lifting weights, but they probably weren't running much. They were probably hanging out partying with their friends. So I needed to get them in shape for fall ball because our coaches always want to hit the ground running and get going. So speed work kind of takes a back seat, maybe one to two times a week, focusing on acceleration and a little bit of top end speed. And when I say that, it's just kind of introing into that work, um, but then conditioning two times a week after my lifts so that we're getting them ready to go. Um, in the weight room, off season is typically three times a week uh, throughout the entire time. Uh, during this first eight hour period, which lasts three or four weeks, um, just focus on reintegrating them to the weight room, building some, some strength, endurance, and capacity, or hypertrophy is kind of the name. Um, soccer on the other side, I focus more on speed during this time because I have more time with them to do it. And really, in the off season, throughout the whole time, whether it's the eight hour period or the 20 hour period, I try to keep speed in three times a week if possible. Um, I'll start off with more acceleration. And for both of these sports, I didn't include it on this side, but it's something I'm wrapping my head around and trying to focus more on would be deceleration, more from a, a injury prevention standpoint, um, and then building towards top speed. So for speed work, generally going acceleration to transition to top end speed is what I do. Soccer will lift three times a week during this time. Uh, his focus is pretty much the same because they're coming off a winter, or I mean a, a summer break, right? Or no, sorry, a winter break. And they probably didn't do everything that I gave them to do. Uh, that's the, the fun part about, as I'm sure you guys are aware, if you program things but athletes are on their own, we basically have to assume that they didn't do it. Um, so it's always about reintegrating after those transition periods. And then for soccer, because we're way out from season, say our first important game is going to be the end of August, and it's January, I'm not that concerned about fitness. I want them to be able to complete, compete at practice and be ready for their spring game, so it's a little bit. But usually I'll give them supplemental work, and they'll be practicing an hour a day, four times a week or so, plus play, playing some pickups, so it's not like they're doing nothing. Um, but that we try to build into uh, over time and really the summer becomes more important for them. So then we go into that 20 hour period. So this is when practices really pick up. So in that eight hour period, both sports, it's you know a combination of practice styles, whether it's individuals or team practices, they can only have about four hours a week. In this period, it's un unlimited essentially because 20 hours is a lot in a week. My my role doesn't really change or it decreases a little bit and they're doing more on their respective sport. So in lacrosse, September to October, they're going full practices pretty much every day and we'll have two to three scrimmages depending on how they, they lay it out. Um, speed work, I try to keep in one to two times a week just to keep them exposed to that. And a lot of these, are due to just how we schedule it out. If in a perfect world, I would do at least twice a week, if not three times a week, just don't have the time. So this is kind of what I'm doing, not necessarily the ideal. Um, and I'm just trying to maintain quality, so mixed, whether it's acceleration, deceleration, top end speed work. Lifting, we keep in three times a week. Um, because this is our main, <coughs> like the fall semester is our main time to do strength and conditioning and really, or I mean, strength work and really build those capacities. And like we said, it's a power speed sport. Um, strength is that underpinning uh, quality of all of that. It's very important for them. So we use this period to do that. And then conditioning, I don't add any extra conditioning because they're out on the field every day doing quite a bit. Uh, they don't really need it. Soccer, on the other hand, full practices will do five games team's going to Portugal this year so they're actually getting an additional three games and they might sneak another like unofficial one in there as well so as many as nine games um, which is pretty crazy for an off-season period but speed work like I said I think it's really important for them and I keep it in there three times a week 
and I get a little more time, which I'll I'll talk about in a second. I I sneak things in in warm ups if I don't have the specific time to do it. So I with soccer, the way my role works, I'm at almost every practice. So I get at least like 10 to 20 minutes to do things. So even if I don't have a set strength and conditioning time, I can sneak in extra work. Um, lifting, this is where it'll go three times a week, but maybe two, because a lot of times our days are Monday, Wednesday, Friday for lifts. We might have a Saturday game and head coach might say, okay, hey, I don't want them lifting the day before the game. If I can get it, we'll still do it and I'll plan it a little bit lighter, but it's not three hard lifts. I have to shift to make sure they're, they're able to compete on the weekends, even though the goal for me is still development through the off season. Um, focus becomes more strength for both sports, um, but I will start adding some strength speed. So it's just working on a continuum going, you know, strength endurance or hypertrophy to more strength to more strength speed. Speed strength is kind of my programming style. Yeah. This is, uh, how long are your sessions? Uh, uh, 60 minutes, 75 minutes? So I would say it's no more than 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. Probably during this time, um, lacrosse, so before in the eight hour period, probably 60 minutes for lacrosse and soccer. As we get into this 20 hour period, that might go down to like 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. Um, lacrosse, because they're just very efficient and are very on top of things. Soccer, I do a little bit less. I'll show you in some programming, I'm just trying to do less and get more out of a few exercises. Lacrosse, we can get through more things, and I think there's sometimes more things to hit with the, the increased body mass, we can afford more volume. Um, and then as we get into like in season, then it might be 30 minute lifts. Uh, right now for lacrosse, I think I'm slotted 40, and sometimes we're done less than that. So it's just kind of, what's the, what's the priority of that time period? Yeah. Um, for soccer during this time, it's still just that supplemental one to two times per week. Again, we're February to April here, not too concerned with our fitness. We're kind of playing into games. And a lot of times guys are getting more playing time because we have a smaller roster at this time as opposed to in the fall. So, um, And then preseason, this is where it's almost the most important period, and a lot of times it's voluntary, so it's kind of frustrating. But for lacrosse, it's after that fall ball period ends, so we might still practice. I think this year we practiced for three weeks or so um, in November, very beginning of December, and then it was finals time, so they started being voluntary and um, didn't have to come in to see me, didn't have practices. Those guys are really good about doing it. So I saw almost everybody until they went home for break and then they all came back ready to go. So that's pretty cool. Soccer, this is during the summer. So it's a pretty long period. Once we're done at the very beginning of May, I don't get to mandate anything for them until the very beginning of August. Now we usually have a pretty good group of local guys that come in and stick around or players that don't go home and they stay here and, and work out. but. I would say at least half the team could be doing it, could be not. So it's kind of hard. Um, but I plan as if this is what you need to do. So for lacrosse, um, speed work three times a week, working all the qualities, kind of peaking towards what I need need out of them, lifting three times a week, start with, start with power or really probably start with strength and then focus on maintaining it and really get towards developing power, strength, speed, speed, strength. And then conditioning two to three times a week. Usually I'll say get at least two in. Um, and this is into in addition to any like skill work they might be doing. But then also some guys more midfielders I'll recommend a third day um, if they, if they feel like they need to do that extra work. Um, on the soccer side, this is around eight weeks. Speed, three times a week, I'll put that on my lifting days. Lifts, I'll start off three times a week and then taper down to two, where one of my days kind of becomes more on the field with some jumps, throws, sled pushes, those kind of things. Um, but 
still with some conditioning and speed and just on field rather than in the weight room doing traditional lifts. Um, focus kind of, I still, because it's a longer period, I'll focus on strength at the beginning a little bit more and then go to those power type qualities. And conditioning, this is where now it's three to four times. I'll start with three times, then build towards four times a week because we need them to be ready to play games in August. I think we have 16 days. That's another important, important part. So for soccer, the time we start our first practice in August to our first game is 16 days. Um, and in a sport that needs more fitness and conditioning, it's a really short period of time to get guys ready to play 90 minutes. Whereas lacrosse, it was at least 21 days, at least three weeks. Um, and they're usually coming in pretty, pretty prepared and the coach is really good at ramping up. And you, when you have three weeks and there's a couple scrimmages in there, it's really easy to, to kind of get them ready to go. That's why conditioning is usually a little bit less. But for soccer, they need to have that base there so they can handle a pretty quick ramp up. Um, so the main programming differences, I could probably talk about just like one phase of training and go through the two and how they're, how they're different. Um, but the main things that come to mind for me when say, okay, this is a program for lacrosse versus a program for soccer. On lacrosse, it's gonna be more of the emphasis on strength. Uh, like we said, power and size and those kind of things are a little bit more important on that sport. Um, and I, I split onto those two body types that I was talking about, the wide, the wide ISAs and narrow ISAs because um, it just has some implications for how well, or how, I shouldn't say how well you move, how you move. Um, one, a, a wide ISA, I don't wanna get too deep into the weeds, but like a wide ISA type guy might be better at doing say a deadlift off the ground, whereas a narrow ISA might be better with a front squat or something like that, just because their body types allow certain movements to, to happen. Um, a wide guy might be better at being a defender, not being moved, whereas a narrow guy might be a better attacker who's able to rotate and be shifty and uh, dodge more effectively. So. Those just have some implications in what I'm trying to introduce into my program. Um, so it leads to me having six different programs, which is kind of a lot to handle. I try to make it as, as consistent across them as possible, but I separate into advanced, intermediate, and beginners already for both sports. And then for on the lacrosse side, I'm splitting each of those into two, dep depending on uh, kind of their body type. And right now it's just, kind of looking at guys, some testing measures, and seeing how they move, depend, like putting them into those groups. So I eventually want to make it a little more standardized and measured, um, but it's kind of something I'm slowly rolling into my programming. Um, there's a moderate, like I said, a moderate amount of conditioning for lacrosse, especially before main practice periods. My goal with them is to prepare them for practice more so than preparing them for games. So they need to be able to be ready to go once we start those practice periods um, to be able to survive. And which is kind of the same case in soccer as well, it's just the conditioning component is so much more. Um, for me, I have less time for speed work than I would like to based on the schedule. So I try to add things in whether it's in the weight room or sneaking it in as part of my lifts, even if I have limited time, um, adding in deceleration work, which is something, we've had some injuries in the past year that made me rethink a lot of this, but trying to get more deceleration work because being on turf, having to change direction so often, uh, the injuries just happen pretty, pretty regularly in lacrosse. So trying to find times to really get get zeroed in on that, get string, stronger, get better eccentrically. Um, so that's kind of a major focus. Whereas on soccer, there is a, a major emphasis on speed and power. Strength is, the strength foundation is very important. I think we all understand that. Um, and I have to take advantage of it at the right time. So if they're playing a whole bunch of soccer, it's hard to really push them in the weight room because it's just a whole bunch of volume all the time. And the coaches get mad that their legs are 
heavy and they're trying yeah. to play. Um, had that this week, even though we didn't even have a whole lot of practice or anything like that. Our total volume for the week was actually lower than the previous week, but we played our first like 11 v 11 scrimmage with ourselves and they looked tired, so that's what happens. Um, the main times for this for me is pre-spring ball and then in the summer. That's when we can really get after it in the weight room, so I have to take advantage of those times. Um, like I said, major conditioning emphasis, especially in the summer. And for, for these guys, I have three to four programs. So advanced, intermediate, beginner, and then sometimes we'll have gray shirts. So a lot of times guys will graduate early from high school and come in in the spring and kind of start their college early. I have two, two this year, I had three last year. So it's becoming more of a regular thing. Um, and it's kind of difficult to work around because I've had a freshman class that just came in and I've gotten them kind of up to speed throughout the fall and now I'll throw in two new, two new guys. Um, so try to get them integrated into the group as much as possible, but just more programming for me to do, which is a, a fun challenge. Yep. Can you talk about the difference of how you do programming for your goalies in both these sports? Yeah, so the biggest, I don't really change much in the weight room. Occasionally for soccer, because of the movements are so different, um, like the say a dive that movement is different so sometimes plyometrics are a little a little different so we won't do as much necessarily like horizontal broad jumps or something like that it might be more of a, a lateral lateral step up jump or something um, I've used sleds to do some lateral things like that um, for lacrosse in the weight room not a whole lot different because it's just building that strength keeping them as healthy as we can um, on the field is probably where it's it's the most for the conditioning side of things. So with soccer, I'll just take everything down or cut days to where like they don't need to be running that much. They'll cover like a third of the distance that that our uh, field players cover. For lacrosse, it's a lot of times they're not even doing the the running side of things with me because they hopefully aren't getting out of the cage. We had an injury this year because of that, um, so maybe that's where we need to do a little bit of a speed and deceleration work, but there, it's like a completely different sport almost. So from my standpoint, it would be get them strong in the weight room, and then on the soccer standpoint, it's just changing the, the plyometrics a little bit to, to prepare them for what they're doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and like I, I mentioned before with soccer, I do a lot of, of work on the field during warmups, especially in season, um, because when I get to in season, you'll see the soccer schedule is crazy and all over the place. And I have to be kind of creative to make sure we're maintaining some of the qualities that we, we got in the off season and hopefully keeping the guys healthy. Um, sorry for this crazy yellow. But yeah, I put it on there and then looked at it like this morning and was blinded. But um, this is, I know this is small and I'm happy to send this to you or anything. So if you can't really see it, um, happy to send you any program that I have. But this is off season examples for, for lacrosse. And I'll just talk kind of big rocks here. You'll notice there's a little bit more exercises on each of these lifts, but for lacrosse in general, I'll go like a heavier day, more lower body emphasis, a uh, lighter day with a <coughs> little bench press on that day, so it's a little bit higher <coughs> upper body, but overall load lower, and then usually more of a volume day or a higher day here. Um, so in essentially like high, low, high. And then on our running, so pre-fall ball, spend more time doing doing conditioning. So the way I laid it out was Mondays we did some tempo runs, just some basic um, aerobic work. To, uh, Wednesday before our lift, we did some speed. And then day three, Friday, was repeat 10 yard sprints. So a little more like uh, repeat sprint ability. And then when we got into phase two, um, this is when they started playing, so shifted away from 
from conditioning and just worked on on speed work. So and right now in season uh, that that changed a little bit, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, for soccer, looks very similar. You can just tell there's less exercises. So three blocks for the most part here, whereas in lacrosse I snuck in four blocks um, just to get a little bit more volume. And the speed, so this is where I do supplemental conditioning. So the last two days on there, the far right that you see are just supplemental conditioning days. I was also figuring out when to do some testing for them. Um, but three days of speed work, usually acceleration, um, change of direction on day two, and then a little bit more top end speed on day three is how I, how I went through that. So shifting to in season for lacrosse, it's for everybody on the time, everybody on the team two times a week, just about every week until we get into conference and we have Sunday games or Friday games and then it gets a little hairy. But, and then we have an additional lift for our kind of red shirt scout guys, um, usually on game day or day before a game. Um, but the way I lay it out, Monday's heavier, Wednesday's a little bit lighter, minus bench press, we'll, we'll bench on that day. Um, the goal for me is to maintain strength. I will lift up to like 85, 90% when possible. Um, just because I don't want that to trail off and these guys can handle it and they, they enjoy going heavy. Um, I try to continue to develop power via Olympic lifts, throws, jumps, and plyos, so kind of keep that spread out throughout the week. And like I said, there's that additional scout lift, and I'll use that lift to... So some of the guys could be like third string guys that might get in if we go up, so I don't want to destroy them on a pre-game pre, uh, pre lift and then they can't run around or they're at risk of injury. But I'd still want to have a day where we're getting benefits in the weight room. So I'll give more of a an upper body and lower body power lift for those guys. And then we have more of a strength lift for developmental kids that aren't, aren't gonna get in or they're red shirting so we really know they're not gonna play. Um, speed work, for sure I'm doing one time a week. Right now we do once a week and then I have an optional day. So Tuesdays we'll do speed work out at practice and then Thursdays I have an optional day if they wanna come in and get some in. And that's more if for either sport, um, trying to get exposure to that max velocity and hard acceleration so that we're staying healthy throughout the week. Especially for lacrosse, if you're only hitting it during game day once a week, uh, could be too much of a spike and eventually we have some, some hamstring injuries, um, which we've had a couple this season so far and I'm happy with how they've actually bounced back from that. So I'm hoping that this is helping at least to a certain extent. Um, conditioning, the only time for lacrosse I'll start to add that in in season would be towards, uh, towards Big Ten play. So Coach Tillman doesn't schedule midweek games pretty much all year. And then he gets a little cognizant of the fact that Big Ten tournament is a Friday, Sunday, I believe, and then Final Four is a Friday or Saturday, Monday. Um, so we go all week or all year, one game a week, and then we'll have two in like three days. So we try to mimic that a little bit through some conditioning. Uh, later in the season, and that might be on a Monday or Tuesday, just getting a spike in, in distance and high, in, high intensity distance to, to mimic as good as we can um, that, that idea or that, that load. And the reason we don't necessarily do it via just practice is because not everybody will get the same load, so this prepares them a little bit more from a physical standpoint. Um, soccer, on the other hand, will lift maybe one to two times a week. And a lot of times that second day at least is optional just because our off days move all over the place. The way Sasho schedules our games out, we might have a Monday game, then a Friday game, then a Tuesday game, then a Sunday game, then a Wednesday game. Like it's all over the place. So our off day, and you have to have one off day a week, um, it just changes constantly. Whereas lacrosse, it's like Saturday, 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 so it's much easier to plan around. Um, but a lot of times, if my weight room times are Monday, Wednesday, Monday's off, so it becomes an optional day. 
or if it comes a recovery day because we just played on Sunday. So you have to be much more fluid. Um, and the focus is way more on the maintenance, mobility, a lot of times recovery for our starters. And then, like I said, the days depend on the game schedule and where we are and what, what teams are in the weight room and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of time doing on-field warm-ups. Every day I'll do some sort of mobility activation and prehab. And prehab, I'm sneaking in strength work, whether it's body weight work or Nordic hamstring curls or um, you know various lunges. I can take implements out to the field and add a little bit more intensity if I'm able to, um, if it makes sense with the schedule. And then I'll microdose speed and plyos. So at least a few times a week, I'm trying to hit some top speeds with those guys, especially if it's only a one or two week um, game day, or one or two game a week. Um, so just trying to keep them exposed to that. And then conditioning is usually more on the recovery side to, <coughs> to help restore after a game. So we'll do some tempo work or like low level intervals for for the starters, or it's top up work for the guys that don't play as much. So a lot of the problem with soccer, if you're not getting on the field or you're only playing 20 minutes, is you're losing fitness throughout the year. So try to use that, that practice day after a game. Um, or I'll give them, if it's an off day, I'll give them conditioning to do so that they're <laughs> trying to mimic that, that load. It's hard to, to recreate game load, but trying to mimic that um, so that they're at least maintaining that fitness. And if their number's called, all of a sudden they become a 60 plus minute guy, then they're able to jump in and handle that. Um, just kind of highlighting here for, for the workouts, you can see it's a little bit less. A lot of this um, core work here is more prehab type stuff, some posterior chains and core. And one thing I'll add in for lacrosse just in general as opposed to soccer is some neck work to hopefully to reduce some concussion stuff um, because of the contact. Soccer, I don't really use that as much because most of the concussions we've had in soccer are just repeat blows to the head from the ball and it probably doesn't matter what I do neck-wise to help them. Um, and honestly, in men's soccer, I haven't had too many concussions beyond that. Um, but in general, heavier day, I'll clean, I'll squat um, on this day. Lighter day is some jumps. We'll do some clean pulls, some jumps, and some bench press. And accessories are all in there. And happy to kind of go through this more if you have questions. But speed work, this is my one, uh, one speed work on Tuesday, one speed day on Tuesdays. So we'll do some jumps out there and then some accelerations with different movements. So I'm trying to get acceleration, deceleration work in there. And then conditioning examples when we get into that time period, this is kind of what I'll do. Tempo runs um, or repeat tens and maybe some short intervals and just volume's pretty low. I take, you know, 10 minutes max to do that kind of stuff for them, but it just gives us a little bit extra push towards the end of the year to mimic that that uh, two game week and then soccer uh, here's here's that general layout very similar from what I plan in season a a heavier lift day one of the week and lighter lift day two of the week uh, things things tend to be pretty pretty similar in season I just might not I'll give ranges or I won't work up as heavy for these soccer guys, especially on, on the lower body, just because they're running so much throughout the week. They have a hard time hitting those top, top percentages and they're just not as accustomed to it as well. And then this is example, I know this is tiny, but this gives you kind of a, I put this in here because <coughs> the craziness of the schedule. So this was the month of September this fall and I planned out kind of things I wanted to touch on in these warm-ups. So you can see the fifth, I think that was, what, Labor Day? We had a game, then we had a game the next Saturday, then the following week it was Friday, then the next week was Tuesday, then we were off Sunday, and just all over the place. So I tried to organize myself so I know when I'm hitting different accelerations, single leg jumps, uh, top end speed, all of that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how I navigate um, 
the soccer in season and you could see where having planned days of the week like Monday, Wednesday lifts could get pretty difficult when games are thrown in just all over the place. Um, so I'd say in season in this kind of is the biggest separation between those two sports for how I attack it. And it's more not necessarily a difference of the sport, but a difference of kind of our situation and schedules and things like that. Um, questions? Um, for bumps and bruises in season, uh, do you feel like it, what are the differences between lacrosse that you see and soccer? <coughs> and how might you have to program around those issues? I know sometimes for my soccer player, they seem to be exhausted when they go to the weight a lot of times. Uh, from the high look, the high demands they have in the field. And so I have to program around those and like you said, the recovery and rehab are a big part of our sessions in season. Yep. I wanted to see if that's similar to what you're seeing and how you might have to address those issues. Yeah, definitely I will see more often I won't even I don't even know if how the the lacrosse player versus soccer player feels is even all that different, but their perception of that definitely is different. Yeah. Um more often soccer like that that first week of the or I mean the first day of the week lift that I'll have might have to be recovery based or I'll take out say squats for the high minute guys because they're feeling tired and beat up um, or because we have a game in two days and we can't do that much whereas lacrosse even if they're feeling beat up they they know the benefit of that heavy lift a little bit more or they they feel better doing that so we'll push it a little bit. And that's where I have to be smart making sure I don't give them too much to where they're digging themselves a little bit of a hole. So like I touched on at the beginning, it's almost more pulling one group back where like kind of managing the stress of the other group and pushing them when I can. Um, as far as like bumps and bruises, definitely see more on the lacrosse side I would say but still still get pretty beat up in soccer games, like dead legs and things like that are pretty common. And um, I think with either sport, just have to work around those things and have options in, in my toolbox for how to, how to address it and keep finding ways, okay, what can we do to get a benefit out of this session rather than just, okay, go do upper body only or something like that. Offense being said, coach, I do in season for soccer and lacrosse, and it's really interesting. The lacrosse players who play soccer are usually just like, "Let's go, we're good," and then everyone else, the, the just soccer players, are like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> "Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't understate the, the like the culture of you know what the weight room does for you." Um, <laughs> soccer versus lacrosse and it's funny I say that and one of the best athletes I've ever coached was on the, the soccer team last year and he was one he played full 90 minutes like his story is great he walked on to the Maryland team earned a scholarship became a starter became a captain and then I'm pretty sure he just signed an MLS first team deal and he was the guy that would play full 90, come in the next day, and I had to tell him, no, you can't do 90% on squats for, <laughs> for singles. So it's kind of funny how those things <laughs> align. Um, but yeah, it's, the, more, the more I've seen from both teams, the more it's just like the personalities. And even on sides of the ball and lacrosse, like the defensive guys are always ready to come in and get after it. The offensive guys are a little bit more like the soccer players. So there's just this continuum mm -hmm. of of dealing with, with what they feel like they can do, what they can handle, and maybe tricking them into doing a little more or less than, than they need to. We also use team builder clubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, with our lacrosse team specifically, we do daily readiness with them. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, I'm gonna try to start doing this too. In the past, I've actually looked at their answers to the daily readiness and told different people based on their answers, what, what uh, like volume they were allowed to do, or what intensity, or what percentages. So, which is really <coughs> annoying to program, but then they can't actually say like, oh, I feel sore. I'm like, well, you didn't say you felt sore in your survey this morning. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that's some, something we do for, at least I do for all of my teams is a wellness survey. And if nothing else, it 
gives you, it starts that conversation. So if you have the kind of player that is going to hide and say they feel fine, but they're really sore, they might be more likely to be honest in a survey. But if you have somebody that's always reporting soreness, it at least starts that conversation so you can talk to them. As the, I have the athletic trainer in on that. Um, so that kind of helps navigate some of those things. Exactly like what you're just saying. Um, I mean, just you go ahead. Go. <laughs> um, like I said, my email is on there. Um, just thanks, Marty. Thanks for you guys here at Landon, and I got to thank all the all the people I work with, and athletes, and everybody that I've worked with in the past. Uh, just thanks for you guys for for listening to me. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention.